Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Nighter podcast. I am your host Kevin Lyapte and I am back with Max today. Uh and we did a episode on stream processing which is the part 1 where we talked in depth about what is stream processing and what are the different options when it comes to stream processing? What are the certain criteria uh that makes it eligible for stream processing and all that? So, if you are interested into learning the basics of stream processing, I would point you to that video that we did previously. And today we are going to cover a little more practical part that we use we tend to use uh at our work uh when we do stream processing. and we are going to show some code examples uh, mainly using apache flink uh, which is a leading streaming platform so uh, let's start uh, with a little bit of introduction again uh, so for our viewers who are new to this episode so welcome max and let's start with a brief introduction uh, about yourself hi kv uh, hello to the listeners thanks for having me again on the podcast I'm excited to um talk about stream processing again today and also um do a little bit of live coding uh on on a real stream processing um application. Yeah. Yeah, so to briefly introduce myself, what can I say? Um I've worked in the stream processing space for some years. I originally got in touch with stream processing because of my job at Data Artisans or Viverica. uh which what was and probably still is one of the main drivers behind uh, Apache Flink. Yeah. And I've sort of stayed in this realm working on um open source technologies regarding to data processing. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, welcome Max. I'm also very excited to uh, have you again and uh today the agenda is a v- very, you know, kind of a live coding part where we are going to sh- show you some practical uh, examples as well using apache flink and also talk a little bit about the concepts that go behind when we talk about stream processing so last time we could not cover a lot about you know uh, time like the concept of time when we are processing events in a stream processing manner and we could not also talk about windowing and join part so pretty much what we are going to talk about is the concept of time uh, how do we window uh, based on the time and how do we join multiple streams and at the end we'll also show some live examples on the same so uh, great let's start with the you know concept of time why is time so important when it comes to stream processing and what kind of times are we talking about here because there are multiple right like event processing time uh there is event time stamp when the event was actually generated uh and then i think the time part uh you know identifies when it was produced and how it can be you know considered for a certain use case that we are performing uh the stream processing on so what is what is your what are your thoughts on that mhm yeah that's that's a very important topic uh in stream processing and something that people who are new to stream processing struggle with. Yeah. So typically uh there's the three definitions of time and at least that's how Apache Flink defines it and and many other um stream processors. So there's uh processing time, ingestion time and event time. And um well, simply speaking, processing time is sort of I guess what we are used to because um when we write a program we put in uh we we generate an ad hoc timestamp uh for example using system current time millis in java or whatever yeah. you use function you use and that's going to give you the current uh qual clock time kind of right yeah. um but and that makes sense a lot of in a lot of situations when you have a logger for example you want to emit the time or so you want to get the current time um but when we talk about um events that have happened in the past it's not a very good um definition of time because we might process an event um at time at, at some or well, we might generate an event at some time because the user clicked somewhere or i don't know yeah. some we might generate some event but then we pr- we process we could process much later why i mean even in a real time scenario 
we we might process it at least a couple seconds later yeah. um or we might just save it somewhere and 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 process it at a later t uh, point in time yeah and so if we want to really reason about that um, event we should know the exact event type so in in flink there's a way to um when we run operations on an event like uh, we window events or um we filter events uh, we can access the event time so that gives us when we always have the processing time obviously as well but the event time yeah. gives us a, a better way to uh, correctly do calculations on events like let's yeah. say you want to want to really know um you want to group your events by 10 seconds windows like you want to make sure that your events really occurred in in a particular time window and and um not in that might be in the past right um and not um yeah it, not uh, you know that they're not in this wrong window because you you just happen to generate your timestamp as you were pro processing yeah. like to go further in this example so let's say um you load 10 events into your system and you do a 10 second processing time window then that would mean all if you processed like if your processing took one second then basically all the elements would be in one 10 second window right because yeah. one second is smaller than, than 10 seconds uh, but the events could have actually been from like uh let's say 30 seconds ago and they could be spaced out by 10 seconds each so that would mean they would be grouped in all into each of their own window and not yeah. within the same window as they did yeah. with processing time so I forgot to mention ingestion time. So ingestion time is conceptually uh, more similar to processing time, but it's it's actually um, ingestion time is actually an event time timestamp, event time timestamp that has been generated uh, during ingestion, and ingestion means typically into the processing ingestion into the processing system. So for yeah. example. Ingesting timestamp would be assigned when you read from Kafka and you have, don't have any timestamp in Kafka, you would assign it when the processing starts. Um, so it's, yeah. Or when the, like the, when the source reads the data, but the, yeah, it, it's actually quite similar to processing time, maybe a little yeah. bit, uh, le more precise than, or more similar to, it sort of sits in the middle between processing and an event time, I'd say. Yeah. 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 Makes yeah. sense. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I think uh, the examples that you gave uh, make sense. Is it is it true that we always care more about, you know, uh, the event time uh, versus the other two types? So when do we, when would we want to use like a processing time? What are some use cases if you have uh, came across? So one aspect where event time is pretty important is when events arrive out of order um, mm. because when you assign timestamps when you do when you do the processing you don't know whether um, events actually occurred um, in reverse order for example yeah. but when you have an event timestamp you can you can actually reestablish the order again makes sense so that that's i guess the use case a like, typical use case would be Let's say you have uh, a mobile gaming app and your users do not always have internet connection. So, but the events are generated on the device. So then when the user comes online, they are sent to the server. And when the server does some, some aggregations, like it wants to like correctly sort those events according to when they happened. Yeah. That would be an example. And you wouldn't be able to do that with processing time. Uh, yeah, makes sense. So uh, basically, uh, so with the event time, uh, when the event actually happened and we want to do certain processing based on that, I think event time is pretty important. And if we want to do aggregations or, you know, reduce operations based on when we are processing it, I think then processing time would make sense. But yeah, understanding the differences between these times uh, is, is critical because if if there is a misunderstanding in in the concept of time, probably the aggregation, so the reduced jobs, so the joining parts is all going to you know be wrong uh, on the real time data, right? Yeah, I think that's correct. You you need just need to be aware what in what 
uh, what time dimension you're thinking, basically. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing like more like better or worse. I think it depends on your application. Absolutely. You Absolutely. So uh, you talked a little bit about windowing. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit more on, you know, windowing. Like what kind of windows are we talking about here? And uh, is it always time-based or windows can also be, you know, the number of events based and so on? Windows are typically time-based, but um, they can also be uh, based on the count, yes. Um, and in Flink, you have very flexible way to write uh, like window assignments and uh, window triggering, and that's very flexible. Um, yeah. One other um, typical uh, windowing use case that is not um, time-based or trigger account based is session windows where basically you're saying uh when when you first get an event for a particular user you um you want to wait um you want to have you know wait at least i don't know 10 seconds um for a second event to arrive um and if, if that second event arrives you still include that in the current window yeah. but if uh if, if it doesn't then basically you may uh, if the, if if another event for that user arrives afterwards, you will you will open up a new window. So that's that's called session windows, and that interval is called the session gap. Um, that's an example of how you can uh, you can have a different type of window than just time windows. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, you you briefly touched also on the out of order events that are coming up. So let's say I'm aggregating based on a window size of uh, let's say ten seconds, and some of the events because they were out of order, uh, they arrive late or they are just delayed, uh, and they came let's say after one minute. So whatever I am doing the aggregation for the ten seconds, uh, I am not able to include those events that are arriving late. So how does, you know, typical frameworks like Flink handle this concept of, you know, out of order events? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So out of orderness is pretty much handled by just using event time. But you, you said um, when they're, so of course there's a case where they are late. Yeah. What, what does mean late actually? So with event time, there is this, I think we touched upon this last episode as well, but in event time, you need some way to signal, uh, basically process in the system. Uh, yeah. So um, there's like events arriving with their timestamps, but also internally the system needs to know, okay, what time is it actually? Because you can't yeah. just buffer events forever. You At some point you need to do something with it. Yeah. Um, so that's called the watermark. And yeah. sort of the, um, the sources decide uh, what the current watermark is, and then they have let the system know. Uh, okay. In typically, and um, I think we see this in our application, this is done by um, defining like a, a a max out of orderness kind of. Um, so, what what that means is um, we look at an event um, that is coming in, and we note the timestamp, and um, we we take note of the uh, basically the mm, max timestamp that that we received so um okay um because that would be um would be a late element basically yeah and um we then decide um well based on the max timestamp we, we receive we decide um we basically subtract um, the maximum allowed lateness time, and then we emit that as a watermark. I okay. think I, 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 I expressed myself a bit confu confusing, but basically we allow a fixed, um, based on the latest element we've seen, we allow um, a fixed uh, duration from that um, um, timestamp as, as, as lateness. Yeah. So what does it, yeah. So what does it mean? Um, Let's say we allow a max lateness of ten. It just means that when when we see an element um, at time uh, x, we we allow up to x minus ten 
um, late elements. Um, okay. And yeah, but every source can decide to do it on its own. There might be like checkpoint events in your data or so where you know nothing will arrive and then you can yeah. emit that watermark. So okay. what, what happens when an element is late? When it's late, it's actually dropped. It's not processed um, by default. Uh, there's also the possibility mm. to handle late data with an extra handler method. But the problem is the reason why we drop, I mean, dropping sounds a bit drastic, but um, there's really not, if you don't define the behavior, there's like nothing actually the system can do because the processing has already taken place. Yeah. Um, so unless you tell it what to do, it just ignores that data. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I think it uh, from, you know, depending on the type of application, uh, it might make sense to just drop the events or might not make sense to drop the events. So maybe there is also the ability to, you know, for all the delayed events, we just push it to a different sync and maybe run like a correction job or something just to correct the historical data. Uh, and real time would be still, you know, more or less approximate based on how much, how many events we could get in the certain time time window, right? So, for example, uh, if it's like a log aggregation uh, system, so if we receive some logs uh, in a delayed manner, uh, we might not have it real time in the real time view, but it can still happen that you know after a day or not not a day, maybe an hour or something, we run this correction job, and for the historical view, the count is still correct. So that can depend on the type of application, right? Uh, so yeah, I think I think it makes sense. Uh, and I don't know if Fling provides such a ability to just yeah. know. No, it does. It does. You can you can define um, a handler for those yeah. late elements, and you can basically try to correct uh, existing results. But yeah. whether that's possible or not depends on the application. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And. Uh, we briefly touched about uh, joins, like joining two data streams and how it works in stream processing world. Uh, let's talk a little bit more on that and then we'll jump right into the demo part of, uh, you know, how things work in Flink. Uh, but we, like, why, why should we join? Uh, why do we need joins basically when we are implementing stream operations and how does, how do joins work at a high level? Well, uh, why do we need joins? Um, I guess we, we need joins just in, in, in any kind of uh, scenario where we work with two types of uh, data sources, whether it's like two tables or in a database or two streams uh, like in Flink. It's just interesting yeah. to, to correlate uh, this data. Yeah, yeah. Um, how does it work? Well, essentially... Um, yeah, those are like two streams that are um, well computed individually and then sent to. Um, well, it it it's it's conceptually quite similar to the general processing model of Flink. Um, typically, when you process uh, real data, uh, you 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 have a key by, um, mm -hmm. or it's sort of a partitioning scheme, okay. and um, so one every well every partition. Uh, for in in a join receives um, those those keys from from both streams, and then um, I think Flink does hash join or so. Um, it it one side is, is is kept in memory, the other side is is uh, run by. But of course, it's important to to um, to uh, remember that in stream processing, we typically do joins on Windows. So um, we first do a windowing, let's say of 10 seconds or whatever, and then yeah. we, we compute the join for, for this window. We don't do the join on the entire stream. We, we, okay. we, we can't, of, of course, because yeah. stream could be infinite. Infinite, yeah, yeah, makes sense. I think it boils down to the you know resource availability, right? Like if the stream is small, because I mean, it depends, uh, typically the streams are, you know, unlimited, but some streams can be just, uh, you know, small, uh, depending on the type of application. So, uh, there's always possibility to change these strategies, I believe, uh, like how you join, uh, but yeah, joining, as you said, if you want to correlate, uh, 
or merge different types of data streams uh, coming from different sources altogether. I think joins is the best way to do it. Otherwise, I mean, we can, I think we talked about this last time as well, that we can always make some network calls on a service to get the data and then do the joins. But I believe it comes with its own trade-offs because you have to make those many network calls. Uh, you have to have your own caching strategy if that data is static or something. Uh, and join gives you like a better, uh, more or less a functional paradigm to work with different streams without thinking a lot about low level uh, things, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. That's, okay. Uh, and then Flink does um, give you full control if you want. Uh, by default, it um, it does this um, basically equi join where uh, it does a pairwise join, but um, it's it's possible to implement other join variants by, um, I mean, there's a low level interface where you can basically receive like uh, the um, all the tuples uh, from from both sides of the join and then implement your own logic. There's okay. also, also, which we're not talking about today, there's also Flink SQL, which uh, has uh, implemented, I think, a lot more join logic. Um, also the table API. So there's some stuff we can still talk about. But today <laughs> we will look at some simple join case exactly. using the Java yeah. API. Makes sense. Yeah, so uh, like along with Max, we have developed a, like a simple or a sample application just to understand these concepts at a high level and understand some of the APIs that are available in Apache Flink. So we have uh, an application or let's say two streams. One is the event stream uh, for activity of a user online. So whenever a user visits some certain page, uh, uh, they can click or they can scroll or they can do some other events or activities. So we have one stream of activities and then uh, the same user can go and purchase some uh, things online. So we have you know, the purchase stream. Uh, so based on these two streams, we are going to demo how uh, you know, the filtering, mapping and windowing works. And then we are going to also join these uh, two streams and figure out some metrics around it. So yeah, for that, I need uh, you know, Max to share his screen and you know, show mm -hmm. us how it works. Do you yes, see I, I my do. screen? Yeah. yeah. So this is <laughs> a demo. Yeah. <laughs> Just to give like a little context. Yeah. For Geek Narrator. Demo for Geek Narrator. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm terrible spelling here, huh? Okay. Yeah. Let's just let's just erase this. Um, all right. So let's look at yeah. the data first. Uh, so this is our data that we uh, generated <laughs> just before recording this episode. So we have uh, yes, we have the user ID, right? Yeah. It's just a simple CSV format. Uh, the timestamp. Uh, the type of event, scroll, click, or enter, or leave. And we have the page that Perfect. we accessed. And we do have a second data set, yeah. but we will talk about that later. So how do we, let me just uncomment everything that we don't need to see here um, for now. So how do we um, get started writing a Flink job? So there's some there's some uh, Maven dependencies that you uh, need to set up. Uh, I think not, we're not going to talk about that today. There's some instructions on the Flink website. But once you have that, um, basically you need Flink streaming Java. I think it's a dependency. And so you first thing you typically do is you, in the, your main method, you uh, instantiate the stream execution environment just by doing stream execution environment yeah. dot get execution environment, very simple. And then you can also set the parallelism here um, directly. Normally, um, this is not something you have to set. Um, you can also, if you don't set it, it will use the default parallelism. 
And also in the cluster scenario, it will just, well, on your machine, actually, we'll use all your cores as per the number of cores. And on a cluster scenario, there's okay. like default the per you can set. But yeah, uh, it does make sense to set this. You can even set it on the individual operators. But this will just set like the default here. So let's set it to one because my machine is already uh, kind of hot <laughs> from recording the podcast. And uh, um, so then you create a, a data stream um, to because you first need to load some some yeah. uh, some streaming data, and um, we we factored this out here into a different method. This is how it looks like. So uh, don't get confused by uh, all the Java code here. But um, so you on the environment, stream execution environment, you do like read text file or add source to add the Kafka source or something like that. But here we're reading from file. And then we uh, do a map here to um, split all the uh, the lines, basically get you process this line by line. And then we, we create uh, like a wrapper, a data wrapper that looks like this, uh, where you have, um, yeah, all these fields, yeah. user ID, time, and activity and page that we talked about. And because we're using event time here uh, for this example, we want to also assign timestamp and watermarks. So watermarks, this is typically something a source does already. Uh, like Kafka source has some options for that, but here we're using the text source. So we need to do this, uh, ourselves. Um, so in, so we, we use, we use this watermark strategy bounded out of orderness. So this will basically, um, when we see an event older than, um, uh, 10,000 millis or 10 seconds confusing uh then we will um e emit a watermark and we also assign timestamps to the events so here we just use the timestamp what we have already yeah. in the in our data yeah because that's the actual event time okay so that's it for the source so when we now print we can now um just print the source um and run the program. Oh, and I forgot um, to execute this. You need to have this environment yeah, okay. dot execute here because this will run the program. Yeah. Otherwise, you won't do anything. And you can see, like, I can run this program in my IDE, and it 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 doesn't need to be a deployed to a cluster. Or you need to build a jar. You, you, that's of course yeah. later needed when you run this on scale, but. You can test this. So yeah. you can see here all the data. Um, interestingly, when you set like the parallelism, for example, to something higher, let's say, let's say, let's set it to three, um, it will, it will already use uh, multiple ta um, parallel tasks to process that same amount of data. And you can see that in, in the printing, we can just uh, quickly sh demonstrate this. Um, get to the output. You can see here there's multiple threads yeah. running. So we can see here's two, there's or the there's one, there's two, there's three. So this gives you an idea how this stuff runs in parallel yeah. later. Yeah, so I have uh, one question here. So the parallelism, uh, is it related to the number of cores, number of threads, or more related to the application and the you know the data? Yeah, so it's more related to how the data is partitioned. Um, okay. In if you run this locally, it uh, pretty much means that it will uh, use three of your cores here in this case. Okay. You have a parallelism of three, so that that I mean it sort of loosely translates to number of threads, but Flink internally has some. Uh, pretty involved threading model. And it do also, it depends actually, of course, on the number of tasks also you run. But okay. think about the parallelism as like the, the divider of your data. So when your data is, um, uh, when you have a parallelism of three, your data will be split into three parts and pr processed independently. 
Okay. And um, that's really the power of distributed stream processing. It's yeah, like yeah. can scale, scale basically infinitely. Okay. And does it mean that Flink can aut uh, also decide automatically, like depending on the data size, that how many partitions should I create? Or uh, the developer always have to give some number for the start and keep scaling up the number of partitions? No, uh, Flink Flink does not have uh, this intelligent auto scaling behavior where okay. it dynamically scales up and down. It the user has to provide the parallelism, okay. and of course, okay. there's some some limits to. I mean, depending on how parallelizable your data source is, it it doesn't always make sense to uh, choose certain parallelisms. For instance, for instance, yeah. if you have a Kafka partition with three uh, a Kafka topic, I mean, with three partitions, then uh, if you choose parallelism 300, it's not going to make it much faster, right? That makes it's sense. Only, yeah. You can only read in parallel from three <laughs> makes partitions. Sense. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. So I think what we have shown is how to load the data and how to create like a data stream out of uh, the source one. And in this case, we were reading from the file, right? Mm-hmm. Right, we were reading from our um, web server log file, which looks like this, yeah. uh, user ID timestamp event time page. And we, we've printed that also. Uh, so now let's say we are interested in a particular event from, from user, or yeah. we want to find all the events for a particular user. Let's say we, yeah. we tap into the stream and say, ah, this user looks suspicious. Let's check uh, what, what has he done. Um, yeah. Uh, so what we do is we just use a simple filter function on the source yeah. and we look for the, for the user ID. So when we yeah. run this, so it's pretty much similar to the Java streams operation that we do. It takes in a predicate and it tries to filter. Uh, the only difference is that this application is runnable on a Flink cluster. So exactly. This yeah. will run. So I, now I choose person one because I'm, I'm just running locally, but yeah, if I had person five. There would be five instances of this filter function running and in those five partitions. Got it. Um, so now we look ah here, this, uh, the yeah. output is a bit hard to read, but we can see we received all the events that yeah. um, occurred for that particular user. Okay. So that's pretty nice. Uh, but I think we can do more. We can, let's comment this out again and look at some something, something more uh, interesting. Yeah. And uh, that is windowing. So um, let's say we wanted to, um, window the uh and record the, the the activity that occurred for for on on a particular page yeah um so let me just uncomment this so it gets more it gets clearer i don't know what is happening here but uh so let's say we we had our source again and we first key them by the page we yeah. do this so uh, Flink can split up the data and we can do parallel data processing. Otherwise, yeah. Flink doesn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an important, uh, this tying back to the parallelism discussion here, yeah. where um, when when I set a high parallelism, but I don't have actually keying of the data, it's, it's just going to default to, uh, um, well, after the processing, it's just going to default to... Um, um, processing on one machine. If I do any sort of uh, uh, windowing or joining, uh, yeah. so that's that's why we need to key by um, key by the page, and then let's say we uh, want to look at ten seconds tumbling windows. Tumbling windows means that uh, there's a window from zero to nine, then a zero from ten to nineteen. So every t uh, ten seconds we start a new window. Yeah. There's also sliding windows which can overlap. Uh, yeah. We're using tumbling windows here. So we have our 10 seconds tumbling window and then we do an apply function which mm -hmm. gives us, it basically gives us all, uh, sorry, it gives us all the input, all the 
all the records that occurred in these 10 seconds. And this is yeah. done based on their timestamp. Yeah. Um, so we get all the data and then we just, uh, we just count them. We use this function to uh, count the iterable. And then we emit a tuple two. It's a built-in type in Flink uh, with a page and the number of activities per page. Yeah. So let's print this. Interesting. So as we can see now, we have here um, all the pages with their activity or numbers of, of events that occurred in yeah. a 10 second timestamp. So now it's important yeah. to note that um, this might be several, my, several windows. So, I mean, we could, in theory, uh, if we wanted to, we could add like the, the window here as well, because we have uh, you have the window here, the time window. So we could say, um, could add it here, uh, but we could also just add um, could it at the uh, end or start of the window. I think by default, uh, the time window has, hopefully has a two string method. So we could just, um, yeah. Yeah, it has. We could just print that as well. That might be interesting. Yeah. Uh, to see, we just have to uh, change our types here a little bit. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, let, let, let's let's. Uh, uh, let, I hope this works. Time window. Uh, yeah. So in a lot of places in Flink, you can use lambdas. Uh, which makes it more convenient, obviously. Um, so something is still ah here. Uh, so you could write this also like this, uh, sort of uh, with these. Um, but in a lot of situations, um, so Flink does actually um, some type extraction to determine what kind of serializer to use. You can set the serializer manually, but this kind okay. of the beauty is here that you don't, it looks like a normal progr program that you write on your machine. You don't think about how is data going to serialize and transferred over the network. So, and that's why, but sometimes lambdas, um, they, they can be tricky with Flink because <laughs> yeah. you cannot get the, the type uh, information. Yeah. So now I'm still, um, yeah, you need ah, to change I'm the still... tuple two. Huh? You need to change the tuple two to tuple three, right? In... Ah, there it is. It was yeah. grayed out. That's why I didn't see it. Everything <laughs> yeah, is grayed yeah. out. I don't see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. So now let's see how this looks like. So you can you can see what kind of see windows window. we have. We might actually um, our data is not that huge, so um. I, probably just see one window to be honest but we could change this parameter here to uh let's see yeah so what we see here is oh we do see different windows it's a little bit hard to tell but here for example um we see page 29 uh from <sighs> this to this right uh and it's a milliseconds it's a bit hard to read what if we look now for page 29 again, right? Let's look at, so there's the second time because this is the second window from like the end of the last window to yeah. uh, again, 10 seconds. So just to demonstrate that. So that makes sense. We get um, a window every 10 seconds for every, uh, for every key, right? That we specified here. Yeah. If if there is a key in that time span, there might not be a key, but in our case, there is. Uh, so, cool. We have that. Next, yeah. next we're going to talk about joins, right? Yeah. Any uh, prefacing questions for that? <laughs> I think we have talked about joins already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I think, um, yeah, joins are interesting and there's a lot more we can do. But here's like a very simple example of uh, what we have done here. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's demo that. Cool. 
So I'll uncomment the join example. So for the join, we've created another data set, which I have here. It's yeah. uh, the uh, purchases data set, which has yeah. the user ID, the timestamp again, and the uh, purchase what is this? ID. Purchase, purchase ID, ID, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, just testing you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm we, not we sleeping. <laughs> so we create the, the source too, which looks very much like the, the first source. We we'll yeah. just do some, uh, some uh, uh, different parsing of the purchase. And then we have an object which looks like this. Yeah. Uh, makes sense. And everything else is pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. I changed this here, but this... okay. We also use um, this out of orderness of ten. Yeah, uh, this the same things about. that that we did for the previous stream, right? It's pretty much exactly. the same. Yeah, exactly. So um, now we have the second data stream. Yeah, from our source. And when on the source one, we we join the source two, and when you whenever you join, you need to of course specify some join criteria. So in Flink, here you you first do the where clause, which are the where function, which it tells you um, normally you would um, in a database query you would specify um, two fields, uh, one from each table, right? So here you do it on the streams. Yeah. And in Flink, you, you do this by um, kind of returning the the key you want or the field you want to use here, yeah. user ID. Yeah. And also you do it with the second. Um, yeah. I like the Fluent stream. APIs here. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful. Yeah. I think this is something that Flink did right. I mean, very early <laughs> on, even like 2014 or so, when like other systems... I mean, Spark was pretty good with this as well. I think uh, they kind yeah. of influenced each other there. But uh, other systems like Hadoop, where you still had to, pff, I don't know, work with really messy Java objects. Uh, yeah. So here you do, and then you do a window once you've joined. And we, again, do choose 10 seconds time window. Yeah. And then we write our join function. So... Flink by default does an equi-join. So for every uh, match you get, um, you, you um, emit a result. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Um, in, so... in our case, it's just a, you know, a number that we want to count. Uh, but it could also be like creating new object, right? So we could also create like a data and purchase uh, object and then combine these two streams and send it over to the other stream, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That, this this um, this is a little bit confusing, maybe here. Um, so because we 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 basically get get called for every match, we decided to um, basically emit a new tuple two with just a just a one as yeah. the count yeah. and our user ID. And then we, afterwards, we do another key by on the user ID, and then we do another windowing to sum up those counts. Uh, that's a little bit um, bef before, uh, as for in the preparation, we, we discovered that it would be nice um, if we got like the list of all um, purchases here. Um, yeah. But um, that's yeah, just, it gets uh, a little tricky. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So for a simple basically... example like this, uh, we had to do this workaround where you know, you you key by uh, you join based on user ID and then you key by uh, the the tuples uh, key, and then you do the window operation again so you can you know sum them up. So yeah, cool. So this should give us now all the all the uh, purchases that occurred in a given time frame for mm -hmm. from a given user. Yeah, makes sense. So let's run this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
All right, and we got some results. So again, we didn't we didn't include the window here, but we see here the first part is the uh, it's user ID. Second yeah. part is the number of purchases. So you can see that some users like uh, purchase quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like, this, this guy, random users purchasing purchasing random things <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool and yeah this user just two uh, this one just one yeah one item so it's pretty neat yeah uh, i think <laughs> yeah so yeah that, that concludes our examples anymore yeah 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 that that makes Question. sense so that's a very you know a quick uh, demo on how things work at a high level for flink I would encourage uh, the viewers, if you are interested in, you know, steam processing or specifically Apache Flink, then there's a lot of information on how things work, how APIs are designed and how different use cases con can be solved using stream processing. So uh, do look it up there. And I hope, you know, the high level understanding of the event time, uh, the processing time and the ingestion time, it made sense. And uh, also the window operation and the join operations, it's it's really powerful. Like when, when it can be used for, you know, really amazing use cases uh, as uh, Max also mentioned earlier. So yeah, I think it, it's, it gives a pretty good insight into how things work uh, when it comes to stream processing using Apache Flink. So uh, do you have anything to add there, Max? Uh, I think we have added uh, given like a very good high over high level overview. I think so too. I, we talked about a lot already and if users have questions, they can uh, write you or me or, or the Flink user mailing list, Absolutely. Uh, reach out to us. And I think we're going to upload the code. Um, so yeah. users can check we it will. out maybe. So I will, I will link uh, the previous video where we talked about all the theoretical and a little practical part on stream processing and different frameworks that we have. So please do watch that as well because there's a lot lot of information there. And this episode could be, uh, so that episode could be like a prerequisite for this one, but not necessarily if you already know the basics of stream processing. So I would encourage you to watch that episode as well. And as Max mentioned, reach out to us if you have any questions and we'll try to answer. And I'll also share uh, the, the code base that we just showed so you can try it out on your own. So great. So thanks a lot, uh, Max, for this quick demo and, you know, the, the introduction to the different concepts in stream processing. And I, I, I really hope that our viewers enjoy and, you know, get good insights into stream processing from this episode. Yeah. Thanks KV. I really enjoyed this session and, uh, yeah, I hope our viewers enjoyed this as well and uh, hope to be on the podcast again soon. Yeah, <laughs> soon, soon. Yeah, thank you.